Anna, Arthur, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to week 11 of, of our focus program. Time flies. We are already in week 11. So we are excited to, to uh, excited to listen to Arthur Nicola from Universita Autonoma de Barcelona, who's going to talk about Blaschke products and inner functions. Arthur, please. Yeah. So thanks a lot, uh, Javar. Uh, it's uh, well, it's of course a pleasure uh, to talk here. And well, first I would like to thank uh, the organizers for their kind invitation and also for organizing the program, uh, the very interesting program. And also, well, to all of you for coming and for listening to this. Okay, so uh, my topic is, uh, as you see, Blaschke products and inner functions. And this is, uh, as you know, a very classical notion. Uh, it may have around 100 uh, years of history. Uh, and they are very classical and important uh, work by Nevan Lina, by Brother Fries, by Smirnov, uh, Frostman, and of course, Berlin. And after this uh, classical work, uh, the, 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 the notion became, I guess, classical, both in complex functional analysis and in other areas. Most of this uh, classical work is collected in many excellent textbooks. So I have decided to follow a less common path. And my plan is to present some results which I find uh, extremely beautiful on uh, dynamical properties and also on statistical properties of inner functions. And um, well, more concretely, this uh, mini course, uh, well, should be something like a geodesic between uh, classical definitions and classical results and more modern uh, results on uh, dynamical and as, said, the statistical, and as I said, the statistical properties of inner functions, which are due essentially to Aranson and Pomerenke, Dering and Magné and Yulsi. You'll see uh, in the next uh, couple of sessions. Most of the results are not uh, collected in textbooks, and one has to refer to, to the classical to the papers in, in, in the journals. Okay? So let's see. Uh, so let's start. Okay, so the plan today is to collect some basic definitions and basic results we will need. And let's start uh, with, uh, well, the definition. Uh, as you see here, an inner function is uh, an analytic function from uh, the analytic function from the disk into itself. So D is the, comp the unit disk in the complex plane, which has this extremal property of having uh, radial limits of modulus one at almost every point in the circle. So inner functions are mappings, uh, as you see. This should be the unit disk into itself. Mappings which bring, uh, analytic mappings which bring the disk into itself and which have this property, right? This nice property that uh, are extremal in this sense. In the sense that they map, in some sense, they map uh, the circle into itself, okay? One important thing, and this will uh, have, uh, well, this will be important, is that the mapping from the circle into itself, defined uh, through the radial limits, it's only defined on almost every point. So this is defined, not at every point, but at almost every point in the circle, okay? So, uh, and as you'll see in a minute, uh, this function, this um, boundary function, this function defined it on the boundary is far from being smooth in general, okay? So, okay. So this is a definition. So then I guess I should uh, give you examples, okay? So here are the examples. There are two families of examples. One is uh, Blaschke products. I hope that you are seeing my writing, right? 
Very good. Yeah. So uh, assume that you have a, a sequence of points in the disk, which satisfy uh, this uh, Blaschke condition. So the sum of the distances to the boundary uh, to the unit circle is summable. Okay, so this means that the points in the disk uh, approach the unit circle at a certain speed so that the sum of distances, so if this is a 10, of course, this is just, this is just the distance. So they approach the unit circle sufficiently fast so that uh, the sum is convergent. Then you can consider the Blaschke product with zero to 10. Which is, which is just this product. So we, here we have uh, some unimodular constants and then uh, we have Z minus Z10, one minus Z10 bar Z, okay? So um, maybe I should uh, use this, yeah, okay. So, uh, well, it turns out that under this condition, under this Blaschke condition, this infinite product converges. So if you only have a finitely many points at n, then we say that this is a finite Blaschke product because it has a finite number of zeros, right? It's clear that the zeros of this function will be just, uh, the, will be just the sequence at n. And moreover, what happens is that this product converges not only at every point in the disk, but at every point in the complex plane minus, say the pole. I want to see it. I have not seen anything. So, is something happening? Okay, minus the. Arthur, please unmute yourself because I muted everybody and you are included in everybody. I'm sorry for that. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I hear you back. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I was saying that the Blaschke product, the, I mean, this infinite product not only converges at points in the unit disk, but also at points uh, which are outside the unit disk as soon as you are far away from the reflected points of the zeros, okay? Okay, so, uh, and it's not hard to believe that this is an inner function. At the end, I mean, you, you need to prove that, but at the end, this is just a product of uh, automorphisms of the disk, which fix the boundary, right? Which send the boundary to the boundary. So it's not hard to believe that uh, when Z approaches a point in the unit circle, this has radial limits of modulus one. So this is uh, uh, an inner function. But there is another collection of inner functions, which are what we call the singular inner functions. These are inner functions which have no zeros. So, uh, so since they are, have no zeros, they will be exponentials. Okay, so this is how one can describe them. So given, uh, uh, given a, a, single, a measure, a positive measure in the unit circle, which is singular with respect to Lebesgue measure. So Lebesgue measure in the unit circle will be denoted by dm. Then, uh, so this means that the measure mu is a positive measure in the unit circle, but it's concentrated on a set of Lebesgue measure zero. So it's concentrated in a small set. So for instance, uh, mu could be a Dirac mass at a point in the unit circle, uh, combination, a linear combination of Dirac masses at points in the unit circle. But you should also think on more uh, sophisticated uh, singular measures. For instance, uh, the Cantor measure in a Cantor set of Lebesgue measure zero, okay? So, 
So given a, 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 a singular uh, measure, a singular positive measure, one can consider this, uh, what we call the singular inner function associated to it, which is just the exponential of minus the Hergold's integral of the measure mu. So again, uh, say z will be a point in, in the unit disk. So this is the definition, and this is an integral over the, the unit circle. So for instance, uh, If uh, mu is uh, a Dirac mass at a point, say psi naught, then uh, the measure will be just uh, this exponential, right? This exponential here, for instance, okay? But as I said, mu could be much more complicated. Okay, so it turns out that this is also a, a singular, uh, I'm sorry, this is also an inner function. And to show this, uh, well, this is, uh, let me give you, uh, say, a pseudo, uh, uh, and a sketch of the argument. You look to the, to, to show that mu is, uh, that S mu is inner. Uh, so this is the question, right? So we need to show, we need to compute the log of the modulus of S mu at the point R psi naught. Psi naught will be a point in the unit circle. And then uh, we need to show that this limit when R tends to one tends to zero. Okay, but here you have the modulus. Uh, so this you have here the modulus. So it's you have the modulus of this exponential. So you need to take the real part of that. And this is very convenient, right? Because the real part of this kernel, of this Herglox kernel, you can compute. And this is just the Poisson kernel. So it turns out that this is, maybe I'll write here minus. Then uh, uh, what I will get here is uh, the integral of one minus R square, psi minus R psi naught square, d mu psi, the integral over the unit circle. And as I said, uh, the plan is to show uh, that this tends to zero at almost every point. But when R tends to one, this tends to the derivative of this measure with respect to Lebesgue measure at the point side knot. This is because the Poisson kernel is an approximation of the identity. So this means that uh, you will get here the derivative of mu with respect to Lebesgue measure at the point psi naught, at least at almost every point psi naught on the circle. And this is the end of the story, right? Because since, uh, since mu was singular with respect to Lebesgue measure, this means that the derivative of mu with respect to Lebesgue measure is equal to zero at almost every point uh, of the unit circle. So this means that this is zero at almost every point in the unit circle because, as I said, mu is singular with respect to Lebesgue measure, okay? So at the end, uh, what we have shown is that this uh, logarithm of the modulus tends to zero. So this means that the modulus of S mu tends to one at almost every point of the unit circle. Okay, so this is a singular. Uh, uh, so this expression here, it's really uh, uh, an inner function. It has radial limits of modulus one at almost every point. And actually what happens is that these are all the examples. Actually, uh, there is a, a theorem here, a classical theorem, which says that any inner function is the product of a Blaschke product and a singular linear function. So F inner, then F is the product of the Blaschke product and a singular inner factor, okay? So of course, uh, here in this decomposition, in this factorization, the points that then are very easily seen 
because of course the 10 are just the zeros of uh, the inner function. And then you have this extra factor, which is the singular inner part of your inner function, okay? Okay, so these are uh, the examples you should have in mind. Blasky products of singular inner functions. And what I want to say next is that what happens is that uh, the behavior of an inner function is very nice. I mean, the, we, are, we are going to be interested essentially on the behavior of the inner function in the boundary, in the unit circle. And we'll see that this behavior is very nice if you are far away from the zeros and from the support of the singular part of uh, the inner function. However, if you are close to the zeros or close to the support, then you'll see that there is a kind of, uh, say, chaotic uh, behavior of the inner function. So this is the content of my next slide, okay? So uh, this, uh, well, the title is uh, Singularities of an Inner Function, and here is the definition. Uh, if you have a, a F is going to be here, uh, an inner function, which will uh, decompose as uh, a Blaske part, a Blaske, Z, a Blaske factor, and a singular inner function, as I wrote uh, here. Okay. Then you define the singular, the singularity, uh, the singular set of the function f as the set of points in the circle where the function does not extend analytically. Okay, so the singular set is a subset of the unit circle and it's the, set, the subset where bad things happen because the function does not extend analytically. Well, um, then uh, what the, the first remark is that this singular set can be easily uh, found when you look to the zeros and the support of the measure. And it turns out that the singular set is precisely the set of accumulation points of the zeros union, the, the close support of the singular measure. So here is, uh, say, uh, uh, um, an example. So assume that you have a, a basket product whose zeros approach, for instance, uh, this point and also this point. Okay, so in that case, the singular set should will be just this uh, the union of these two points. But uh, as I said, the only condition uh, you require on the zeros is the Blaschke condition. So the only condition you require uh, on the zeros is that the sum of the distances to the boundary are convergent. So this means that the sequence of zeros must tend to the boundary uh, very fast but they could accumulate uh, to every point in the unit circle. So in other words, it could happen that this set is the whole unit circle, okay? So this singular set could be large. Okay, so let me, let me show that. Okay, so uh, there is a part, I mean, here, let me show this uh, identity. So this part is uh, essentially, well, it's trivial, right? Because if you have a point uh, which is not uh, in here, so it's not uh, an accumulation point of the zeros or it's not a point in the support of the measure, then what happens, as I said, is that both the Blaschke product and the singular part extend analytically because this you can see directly from uh, the formulas, right? See, if you are far away from uh, the zeros, this extends analytically. If you are uh, far away from the support of the measure, then you don't, do not need to integrate over the whole unit circle, but only on the support of the measure. So this, denomina this denominator here never vanishes, and then the function extends analytically. Okay, so this is, uh, in that case, is trivial because both uh, factors, these and these, extend analytically at psi. Okay, for, 
for the other, the other inclusion, what we are going to show is that uh, if you have a point, uh, if you have a point in here, if psi is a point in here, say psi naught is a point in here, So an accumulation point of the zeros or a point in the support on the close support of the measure, then we are going to show that there exists a sequence of points converging to psi naught such that the function at these points tend to zero. So if you, uh, if you are close to the zeros or you are in the close support of the measure, you can always find points which are very close to this and still uh, on which the function tends to zero. Then of course, if this happens, then it's clear that the function cannot extend analytically at the point psi naught, right? Because uh, you cannot extend analytically because if so, uh, if you could, the function should have modulus one right at this point because it has modulus one at almost every point. Okay, so how, how, how can you see that? Uh, well, it's quite easy, right? How, how, you can, how can you choose these points Wn here where the function tends to zero? So here there is two cases, right? If uh, psi naught is actually an accumulation point of the 10, then you can take as Wm, this Wn could be just a subsequence of the zeros, the subsequence which tends to psi naught. Just a subsequence of the zeros. So in that case, I mean, if uh, you are in this situation, then it's clear. What about if you are in the close support of the measure? If psi naught is in the close support of the measure, then what happens is that you can find points, other points in the circle, which approach psi naught such that the derivative at these points with respect to Lebesgue measure is infinite. And in that case, it's again easy because if the derivative is infinite, then what happens is that the corresponding singular inner function at these points tend to zero. So the situation in that case is the following. You have here the point psi naught, and here you have the points psi n, which approach this point psi naught. Then what we are uh, saying is that the radial limit here uh, tends to zero. So what you only so what you need to show what you need to do is the following. Then you will, you can take W n to be just R n psi n, where R n tends to one. Okay, so you take points which are close. This will be R n psi n then uh, this will be extremely small and these points of course will tend to the point psi naught. Here will be next, here will be next and so on, okay? So in other words, uh, at the end, what we have shown is that the, the singular set of an inner function consists precisely, I mean, the bad set, the set where the function does not extend analytically, consists of two parts, the close support of the measure and the um, accumulation points of the zeros. Now I'd like to tell you that uh, the situation at this singular set is uh, very, well, it's uh, uh, the behavior of the inner function at each of, uh, at any point of this singular set uh, is very wild. And he's the, here is the contained of, uh, of uh, my next slide. So here is the theorem. The theorem says that uh, you have an inner function, again, F will be an inner function, and uh, then you have this singular set, right, on the unit circle. 
which could be, as I said, the whole unit circle, okay? Or maybe it could be an arc. So it's, it could be a, a large set. So, well, then what happens is, so for instance, a thing that this is, this is just an arc. Then what happens is that your function extends analytically outside the singular set. So here uh, you have uh, an analytic extension. However, the behavior, as I said, in the singular set is very wild. So this is, uh, well, uh, this is uh, described by this uh, set, this cluster set. So let, let, me, let me explain what this uh, notation means. So here is the definition, a cluster set of a function at the point psi. So psi will be now a point in the singular set, okay? So here is a point psi. Okay, so uh, the cluster set of, uh, say, this inner function at the point psi is the set of uh, possible values of, I'm sorry, of possible limits of the function f. So is the set of uh, complex values such that there exists a sequence of points tending to psi such that the function tends to w. So it's the, the, the set of possible limits of the function f when you approach this point psi. Okay. So what the theorem tells you is the part, I mean, part B of the theorem tells you that the cluster set is as big as it could be. It's the whole closed unit disk. Okay. And this happens for all uh, points in the singular set, for all points in the singular set. So this means that, as I said, the behavior of the function, uh, of the inner function, at any point of the singular set is very wild because the possible limits are as, I mean, the possible, the set of possible limits is as large as it could be. It's the whole closed unit disk, okay? Okay, so let me try to explain uh, a proof of this uh, result. I'm going also, this is still very classical. I'm just going to sketch it, okay? So, the idea, well, part A is already proved, right? Because uh, if you are outside, the, I'm sorry, if you are outside the singular set, then uh, both uh, the Blaschke product and the singular inner part extends analytically. So here, uh, part A is already proved. So we need to restrict to part B, okay? And as you'll see, uh, part B is, uh, well, in a sense, I already proved it because uh, what we show uh, is that if you have a point psi in the singular set, we show in the previous proof that there exist points. We know we already did that. We, we know that there exist points. Let me call them uh, as alpha n in the disk converging to psi such that f of alpha n tends to zero. So this means that you have, if you have a point in the singular set, the origin is in the cluster set. Zero is in the cluster set of this function at the point psi is, is a possible limit, right? When you approach this point, the function can approach the origin, okay? But then of course you can apply this. So now fix a point W in the disk. Then you can apply uh, this argument uh, to not to the function F, but to the Mobius transform of this function. This is of course also an inner function. And the set of singularities of this inner function is the same of the set of singularities of F. So psi is also a singular point of this function. So we know, so this is inner and the singular set of these is of course the singular set of F. And psi was here. So psi is a singular point of this function. So there are, so hence the origin is also in the cluster set of this function. At the point psi. 
So this means that uh, there are points where the function f tends to w. So this means that w is in the cluster set of the function f, right? And then, well, of course, uh, what happens is that the whole, what we have proved is that the whole disk, the whole open unit disk is contained in this cluster set, okay? So what we know is that the whole unit disk is contained in the cluster set. But of course, the cluster set is a set of possible limit values. So it's a closed set, right? And it's a closed set, of course, contained in the closed unit disk. Whoop, this should be closed. Is a closed set. So this means that the cluster set is the whole thing. So this, well, with these two screens, what I have, I, uh, what I hope I will, I have convinced you is that when you look to the, an inner function and you look to its boundary values, which are only defined at almost every point, then there is always a good set and a bad set. The good set is, uh, well, the set where the function extends analytically, precisely the complement of the singular set. And then at the bad set, the function behaves uh, as wild as it could be. So this means that uh, when you look to this uh, function defined at, uh, at the boundary, you should be especially careful when you look at points where the function does not extend analytically, because there uh, the situation, the, comp the behavior of the function is very wild. And it's a kind of zero one law. If you are outside this set, the situation is very nice. If you are in, inside this set, the situation is very chaotic. Okay. So now I have a couple of uh, slides uh, where, well, I, I, I will not present proofs, but uh, I will just uh, refer to this cl to classical textbooks, okay? One concerns uh, angular derivative. So what's the angular derivative? So it, when you have an analytic mapping from the disk into itself and you have a point in the boundary. So the idea is that in some cases, you can define what the, even if the function does not extend analytic, analytically at this point psi, you can still define the derivative in a, in a sense which has a lot of meaning, the derivative of the function at a boundary point, okay? So here is uh, the unit disk. Here you have this boundary point. Okay, this is what's called the Julia uh, Carat Theodori uh, theorem. It says the following: that if you have your, if you are in this situation, the following three conditions are equivalent. The first is that the lim inf. This, uh, observe that this is uh, a lim inf uh, when you approach the point psi in any possible direction. This lim inf of one minus mod g over one minus z is fine. Second uh, condition, I mean, this, the fact that this is finite is equivalent to the following condition. The function has radial limits, even non-tangential limits when you approach the pump psi. This is my notation for uh, non-tangential limits. And this non-tangential limit lies in the unit circle. So the function G maps in a sense this point to a point in the unit circle. And moreover, the divided differences, uh, as you see here, these divided differences uh, has a limit when you approach, again, non-tangential. This is the second condition. The third is, uh, the first part of the third is uh, identical to, to, to the second. And here, instead of the divided differences, you can replace the divided differences by uh, the, lim the non-tangential limit of the derivative. Okay. These three conditions are equivalent, and this uh, thing is what's called uh, the angular derivative of the function g at the point psi. Well, in the case of inner functions, this, I mean, this, this result holds for any analytic uh, self-mapping of the disk. 
in the case of uh, in the case that g here is an inner function, then you have a very nice description, and this is essentially due to Frostman and Marcel Ries. It says the following: that if you have a, a, an inner function, then the I'm sorry, uh, the the modulus of the of the angular derivative at the at the point psi is precisely this quantity, just uh, the sum of Poisson kernels at the point psi. At the, I'm sorry, the sum of Poisson kernels at the at the zeros of the Plasky product evaluated at the point psi plus two times the integral of this uh, of the singular measure. This is very nice because uh, what this result tells you is that uh, when this quantity is finite, the function f has an angular derivative at this point, and when this quantity is infinite, the function does not have an angular derivative at this point. So it's it's an if and only if, right? Um, this is actually formally it's. Formally, it's not hard to show that. Uh, what is uh, a little bit more uh, delicate is precisely what I have said, uh, to show that uh, when this is finite, the function has an angular derivative. But from the formal point of view, this is quite easy. Let me just, uh, uh, well, mention, mention this from the formal point of view. Okay, so what happens is that this is a, a Instead of writing the modulus here, what you do is you write, you do this trick. Okay, so of course, since you are in the unit circle, F has modulus one, Psi has modulus one, so nothing happens here. When you compute this quantity, this turns out to be positive. This is the, the, the trick. When you compute this, this is just positive. I'm not caring about conversion, right? I'm just acting for more. And then, of course, this is just uh, the sum of the two logarithmic derivatives of uh, the Blaske part and the singular inner part. So this is just psi times b prime divided by b and psi times s mu prime divided by s mu. And then when you act this uh, in this way, then you just compute uh, uh, the, the Blaske product is of course a product. So uh, this is the logarithmic derivative of a product. So it's the sum of logarithmic derivatives and then you get this part here. And when you compute this, this is again very easy because s mu was an exponential. So this is easily computable and you get this quantity here, okay? So this is uh, the notion of angular derivative, and this is used in my next uh, class, uh, the next result I want to, to recall, which is still classical, and it's uh, the Benjoa Wolf theorem. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to move to dynamical properties of inner functions. So the first uh, result in this direction is this uh, classical result, which uh, tells you about the dynamical uh, behavior of the inner function inside the unit disk, okay? In, in, in the interior of the unit disk. So, um, so let G be an analytic mapping from the disk into itself. So for instance, an inner function, but could be just an analytic mapping from the disk into itself. And what we are going to do is to and assume that G is not an automorphism. And what we are going to do is to look at the nth iterate of G. Okay, so we are going to iterate this uh, picture n times. Okay, and this is just uh, the nth iterate. Okay, so this will be just the nth iterate. It's not the power, but just the iterate. So the, the Indropal theorem tells you that there is always a, a, an important point, and this is the, the point P. So uh, there are two possible situations. So assume that you have a fixed point, that your function G fixes a point inside the unit disk. Then what happens is that these iterates converge 
uniformly on complex of the unit is to this fixed point. But it also could happen that your uh, mapping has no fixed point in the disk. So if you don't have any fixed point in the disk, then what happens is that there exists a point in the circle such that, so there is a point in, in that case, there would be a point in the circle. So for, for instance, here, such that uh, the radial limit is equal to P. So this means that the boundary mapping fixes the point P. So the point P is in that case is not in the in the disk but in the circle, but it still is a fixed point. And then it still happens that the iterates converge uniformly on complex to this fixed point. Moreover, it happens that the, the angular derivative at this fixed point is smaller or equal to one. Okay. So in other words, what uh, the Dragwell theorem tells is that. Uh, there is always a fixed point. And uh, maybe this fixed point is inside the disk or maybe it's on the circle. But it always happened that the iterates converge uniformly on complex of the unit disk to this fixed point, okay? So in practical terms, how, how would you find uh, this fixed point? Um, so in practical terms, this fixed point acts as an attractor the iterates converge uniformly on complex to this fixed point. So how you find this, uh, the fixed point, which by the way is called the dendroit wall fixed point, P, ah, here is, uh, P is called the dendroit wall fixed point of the function G. So in practical terms, you find it uh, in the following way. So if you have a, a fixed point inside the unit disk, this is the dendroit wall fixed point, and you don't need to, to worry more about it. But if you find no fixed, I mean, if your function has no fixed points inside the unit disk, it could have infinitely many fixed points in the circle. But among these infinitely many fixed points in the circle, there is just one which satisfies this condition. This angular derivative is smaller or equal to one. And this is the dendroit wall fixed point. So in, in the circle, if your fixed point is in the circle, the dendroit wall fixed point is uh, described by this condition, among the fixed points is the only one which satisfies that this is a small or equal to one. Okay. Okay. So here, uh, this theorem has, as you see, two parts, and the first part is really easy. And the second is uh, well, the proof of the second is more is more tricky. It's more complicated, but still, it's uh, well, you 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 can find it in many uh, texts. about it. Okay, so, um, so now uh, let me start with, uh, well, some dynamical properties of, of the inner function, but now not look as a mapping from the disk into itself, but as a mapping from the circle into itself. So what we are going to, in the, in the next, in this session and in the next two sessions, we are going to worry essentially about uh, the behavior of the mapping defined on the unit circle in the boundary, okay? So here is uh, the first important fact, which is the invariance of harmonic measures. So let me start with uh, the definition. So if you have uh, dm, as I said, will be uh, my notation for normalized Lebesgue measure on the unit circle. So the measure of the unit circle is just one instead of two pi. And whenever you have a point z in the disk, so here is the disk, you have a point Z and a set E. So for instance, this set E, this is the harmonic measure. And this is the definition of uh, harmonic measure from the point Z of the set E, which lies on the circle. So it essentially measures uh, how you see the set E from the point Z. So imagine that you are standing on the point Z here, right? And say that your horizon is the whole unit circle. So what this quantity measures is which proportion of the horizon, of your horizon, which is the whole unit circle is covered by the set E, okay? So for instance, if instead of here, what, instead of here, you have a point which is in here, 
you essentially see the set E, right? So this means that this harmonic measure is very close to one. However, if you are in here, if your point set is in here, you essentially see no set E, right? The, all your horizon is located around this point. So this harmonic measure is very close to Z. So this harmonic measure measures, uh, well, as I said, the, the, the part of, your, uh, of the unit circle which you see from the point Z. It's, it is, of course, a, 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 a harmonic function. I mean, this is just a harmonic function of the, this function as, as a function of Z is harmonic. It's just a Poisson integral, so it's harmonic is of course between zero and one because it has boundary values. When you approach the circle, when you approach your set E, this tends to one, and when you approach the complement, it tends to zero, right? So it has the same boundary values as the characteristic function of the set E, right? It's just the Poisson integral of, of the characteristic function of E. Okay. It's also very important because it's conformal invariant. Uh, the harmonic measure from the ZE, so this is part of, uh, I guess it's important because it's conformal invariant. So the harmonic measure, if you consider tau to be the automorphism, which interchanges zero and Z, then the harmonic measure from the Z from the point Z of the set E is precisely the harmonic measure from the origin of the set tau of E. And this is precisely, of course, the harmonic measure from the origin, as you see here, is just when Z is the origin, is just Lebesgue measure, right? So it's just, this is just Lebesgue measure of this, okay? So what happens is that harmonic measure, uh, is invariant under inner functions. And this is uh, something what sometimes is called Leffner lemma. So if you have an inner function, it's very nice, right? Because here you have your inner function And you have here a set E. So for instance, E could be an arc, okay? Just this arc here, okay? So the pre image, as I said, the, the, the function defined at almost every point is far from being continuous. It could be discontinuous at every point. So the pre image of an arc could be something very complicated, could have many different components, for instance. So what happens is that uh, if you have a, here a point F of Z, the way you see F, the set E from F of Z is the same as the way you see the preimage of the set E from the point Z. Okay. So for instance, assume that uh, your point Z is a fixed point of your function F. Then what happens is that uh, harmonic measure is invariant. The invariance means that the measure of a set is equal to the measure of the preimage. So for instance, if P is equal to zero, this means that the measure of the preimage is equal to the measure of the set, okay? So let me finish uh, the talk today by explaining the proof of this result, which is uh, something which is essentially obvious. Okay? It's obvious because uh, why this uh, result is true? Well, it's true because both are harmonic functions, right? This is harmonic and this is harmonic. Uh, both are bounded harmonic functions. It's always a harmonic measure is always bounded between zero and one. So these two, you want to show that these two harmonic functions are equal. So you only need to show that the boundary limits are the same at almost every point. But the boundary limit of this harmonic function is precisely the characteristic function of uh, the indicator function of F minus one of E. 
And the boundary limits of this is, of course, the point, I mean, it's this will have limit one precisely when Z is in the pre-image of the set E. And will have limit zero if you are outside the pre-image of the set E. So the, these two harmon bounded harmonic ha functions have the same boundary limits, so they must be the same. Okay, so they are the same. So I guess I will finish with this uh, today. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you indeed, uh, uh, Arthur. Let's thank the speaker for the full talk. Is there any question or comment for, for Arthur? Uh, Arthur, one comment. Yes. Uh, uh, on page six, you mentioned a result for Frostman and Greece. Uh -huh. I, I don't know why I always thought that this is an, a result of Ahern and Clark. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I also thought that. Uh, and then um, it seems uh, as far as I, well, um, well, my comment is that maybe you are right. Actually, I thought that you were right, but when I was preparing the course, I saw in several places that, for instance, in the mono, in the survey of Edo Saxman, I saw that he attributed this result to, to Frostman and Brice. And actually I saw it in another place. So, but I have to confess that I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at the original papers by Frostman and Brice. So maybe, maybe Maybe you are right, and what is what I'm sure is that this uh, identity is also proved in in, in a paper by Ahern and Clark. Okay. You're right, um, but I think it's probably the, previous. Yeah, uh, the the result I think Javad is referring to. So the result you stated here, Artur, is of Frostman and Reese. The result mm -hmm. of Ahern and Clark is that uh, this condition is equivalent to every function in the model space corresponding to the inner function has a non-tangential yeah. limit at that point. So that's- Yeah, you're, you're, yeah you're right. But uh, precisely in that paper, they start, I guess it's the same, it's the same paper. They start showing this, right? right. Showing this identity, Ackerman and Clark. And uh, I guess that they prove uh, again, this identity. So it could happen that they were not aware of uh, the previous uh, papers by Frostman and Brees, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I should have a look again at the paper. Maybe another difference is that Frostman and Ries considered singular inner function, but Ahern and Clark, it could be any positive measure. Maybe, I have to double check. Okay, yeah, yeah, I should also check, yeah. yeah. yeah maybe you are right, yeah. Mm. Which is true, I mean, it can have an outer factor. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, any any further comment or question for, for Arthur? If not, let's thank him again. We